Democrats and Republicans have been sparring for months over the federal government's two main social safety net programs, Social Security and Medicare. In Tuesday's State of the Union address, President Biden said some, but not all Republicans, want to target the programs for cuts. His remarks drawing jeers from some members of the GOP, all of it leading to an unusual moment of live policy negotiation and apparent agreement. Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be funded. All right. We got unanimity. Let's all agree, and we apparently are. Let's stand up for seniors. Stand up and show them. We will not cut Social Security. We will not cut Medicare. While Republicans have accused President Biden of misrepresenting their proposals, a handful of GOP lawmakers have floated making changes to the programs. If we really want to talk about the debt and spending, it's the entitlements program. We're down to a small fraction of the, the federal pie to run the discretionary part of government. So entitlement reform is a must for us to not become Greece. We ought to every year talk about exactly how we're going to fix Medicare and Social Security. Here's what's happening. No one that I know of wants to sunset uh, Medicare and Social Security. But what we're doing is we don't even talk about it. Medicare goes bankrupt in four years. Social Security goes bankrupt in 12 years. The president took his message to Florida today, promising to protect the social programs crucial to seniors. Folks on fixed incomes relying on Social Security and Medicare to get by. They deserve a greater sense of security and dignity. I know that a lot of Republicans, their dream is to cut Social Security and Medicare. Well, let me say this. If that's your dream, I'm your nightmare. And following all of this closely is our congressional correspondent, Lisa Desjardins. So Lisa, let's dispense with the politics just for a second, shall we? And talk about the underlying issue. Medicare and Social Security both face the same basic problem in that people are living a lot longer than they did when these programs were created. Where are we with the solvency of both of these programs? Let's take a minute to look at it. So this is according to the trustees for these various programs. First, let's start with Medicare. Right now, if Congress does nothing, Medicare will be insolvent in 2028. That used to be a date far away. It isn't anymore. That would mean if, again, nothing happens, the payments to medical providers would be cut about 10%. Social Security, a little bit longer, but still a major consideration here is that retirees, that retiree fund would be insolvent in 2034. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman of WGBH Boston has been looking at possible changes to the social security system. Tonight he explores the question of whether some taxes could be raised to close the funding gap. Here's his report. But there was another response. I always enjoy Mr. Salman's features. We got a fair number of viewer emails, including several like this one. I hope you have another segment on the possibility of raising the cap at which we stop paying the tax. Sincerely, Genevieve LeBlanc, Eugene, Oregon. Well, Ms. LeBlanc, since you went to the trouble of dramatically reenacting your email for us, the least we could do is look into your question. What about closing the funding shortfall by lifting the cap on income subject to Social Security taxes? And that would mean, if Congress does nothing, cuts of about 20% to benefits. And where better to ask about caps, we thought, than here? Commencement at Columbia University, where the typical graduate is likely to out-earn the income cap eventually, and graduating MBAs, according to last year's numbers, will start out-earning the cap right away with an average starting salary of, get this, $143,682 a year. So we rounded up a group of MBAs and their parents for a mini-symposium with economist Stephen Zeldas, an expert on the financing of Social Security. Right now, you pay 12.4% of earnings up to a cap of $90,000. That is split between employee and employer, but no taxes are collected on any earnings over $90,000 per person. Now, the income cap on the payroll tax has risen, slowly, since 1982, indexed to average earnings. If earnings continue to rise, as in the past, the cap would rise but not nearly enough to keep pace with projected Social Security benefits. Removing the cap entirely, thereby imposing a flat tax of 12.4% on all earnings, essentially a $100 billion a year tax increase on the wealthy, would more than completely close the funding gap. Even lifting the cap today to, say, 150000 by using a different index would solve more than half the problem. But such calculations beg the question, why was there a cap in the first place? Well, Social Security was controversial when it was first created. President Roosevelt was careful to sell it as insurance, not welfare. We can never insure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-stricken old age. But to some of the wealthy, this must have sounded like welfare, which their Social Security taxes would be paying for. To get them on board, an upper limit was placed on income subject to the Social Security tax. Can I just ask you one quick question, just to put them on hold for just a second? Okay. To most people, though, at least on and below the sidewalks of New York, raising the income tax cap on Social Security seemed an obvious solution. There shouldn't be a cap on it. Everyone should have it. Up as high as, as long as you're making the money, you should have to pay on it. Another way to think about that for Social Security, Jeff, is anyone in this country who's 56 years old or younger would see their Social Security benefits cut by at least 20% if Congress does nothing. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, of course. Because then it would help the lesser person. I'll be in favor of the It's just a tiny little bit that richer people have to pay, and they, they won't feel it. So if you made a half a million dollars a year, you think you wouldn't mind paying an extra 
dollars $60,000 for Social Security? So that all the people are going to be safe? Yes, I wouldn't mind. So you've got more than, what, 60 million Americans enrolled in these programs right now. What are the possible solutions? Okay, let's go over that because it's not easy. There's one reason they haven't done this is because these aren't easy decisions. They're going, someone's going to have to make sacrifices. Number one, one thing that they could do is increase payroll taxes for some or all Americans. Maybe richer Americans pay more. That's one idea. We could, they could also raise the eligibility ages even more or the criteria for qualifying for these programs. They could also reform how Medicare pays medical providers specifically. There could be a lot of savings there. And then the bottom one is lower benefits for some or all Americans. Now, most of those we spoke with probably made less than $90,000 a year. Maybe class resentment was a factor here. And, of course, we were in New York, perhaps the bluest city in the bluest state. But a CNN USA Today Gallup poll in February found that two-thirds of Americans supported applying a Social Security tax on all income. And at Columbia, folks who will obviously be affected by a rise in the tax cap supported it almost as enthusiastically as those out on the street. How many people are in favor of at least raising the cap to 150? Not is what you often hear referred to as cuts, but if you raise eligibility, that also means fewer benefits for fewer people. In all of this, Jeff, timing matters. The longer that Congress and the President wait to make these decisions, the deeper those kinds of cuts could be in the future. So this all ties into the country's debt problem. What would it mean for the bottom line if Congress does nothing to address the solvency issue? Think about Medicare and Social Security as almost the equal of the regular agency budget for all of government. So if you don't address the red ink in those program programs, you have a major problem. You have fewer options for what to cut. We talked to Larry Le Levitt of the Kaiser Family Foundation about what exactly would happen if Medicare and Social Security continue to bleed this red ink. If you want to balance the budget and you take two big programs in Medicare and Social Security off the table, uh, probably defense spending is largely off the table as well. The next big chunk of the federal budget is, is Medicaid. So if you're going to balance the budget and take all these other tools off the table, uh, you're probably looking at big cuts in, in a program like Medicaid. There was, however, an articulate holdout. Certainly you can't tax just a tiny portion of the people to get yourselves out of this problem. You can. You mean you should. Uh, correct. <laughs> I'm not a part of that population right now. But, but you hope to be. I hope to be, yeah. <laughs> Between now and 2045, I hope to have a few years while I'll be in that part of the population. So it turns out, there's one of our dozen or so interviews out on the street. You want there to be a ceiling? Yeah. Uh, because maybe you'll be making that kind of money, yes? Almost. <laughs> the program for lower income Americans. And what he's saying there is Republicans say they want a balanced budget, hmm. but if you don't change Medicare and Social Security or affect the Defense Department, Medicaid is probably the next big target left. No one's proposing cuts there, but he's saying one plus one plus one, this is what's left. So what then are Republicans, what are Democrats proposing to do about this? Okay, here's where we get <laughs> myself. I think exactly. <laughs> We're going to be talking about this probably more down the road. Let's talk first of all about Florida Senator Rick Scott, whose name comes up a lot in this. He is proposing something very specific. He's using the word sunset, and he says he wants to sunset every federal program every five years. Basically, look at every federal program every five years as part of that are Social Security and Medicare. He has not yet proposed specific cuts to those programs. But listen, I've talked to him a lot about the national debt, and he is really kind of out far front on the national debt. He does think government needs to shrink, and I'm waiting to see what his proposals will be specifically for how he would deal with Medicare and Social Security because he talks about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Other than that, the truth is there's no plan. There is not really a full proposal from Democrats or Republicans. Senator Joe Manchin, the Democrat, I said he wants to try and perhaps propose a commission, but the White House initially has said, no, we're not going to talk about that, at least not as part of national debt proposal. So we have a major problem looming. It's coming fast. Yeah. There's no plan quite yet or no discussion yet either. Lisa Desjardins, I learn so much whenever I talk with you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks. See you. An important reminder then from our man in the van and the freshly minted MBA in the back row, some people hope they are going to be wealthy and think the American dream involves not being penalized for it. That's what makes the country great is that we're all optimistic and that we think that we're going to reach that bracket whether we make it or not. Everybody thinks they're that fellow up there and it's a good thing they think that. Everyone strives to be what that guy hopes he will be. I feel a little bit less isolated now. <laughs> Reminiscent of President Roosevelt's worries about alienating the wealthy, there were two other arguments against raising the income cap without raising benefits commensurate with the higher taxes. A, I think it's unfair, and B, I think it's going to create an incredible incentive for people to find a way to beat that system. What you are describing is a system where the person pays in and gets nothing back at the end on that level there. Tracy's with us in Seattle. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. How much is in your yeah. nest eggs? Um, total net worth between our house, which is paid off, his 401k, my deferred comp, savings, etc. We're right between probably 2.9 and 3.1. Way to go. You've done such a great job. Congratulations. How, yeah, much, of this did, how much of this did you inherit? Um, just less than a year ago, I inherited about 300000 So you're already making well, it? We were already millionaires. We were worth about two, between 2.6 and 2.7 when my mom passed away. Yeah, wow. You've done so well. Congratulations. Very well done. Yeah, thank you. So the thank bottom you. line answer is this. It doesn't matter. Social Security doesn't mean beans to you. you got $3 million. You can do yeah. whatever you want to do. It doesn't matter. Now, if you want to do, yeah, if yeah. you want to have a math discussion just for the theory of it and the fun of it, Social Security dies when you die. And it's a negative rate of return. The money you put into Social Security, you will never get all of it out. Right. So you might as well get all you can get as fast as you can get. So I take it early and often and just throw it into an investment if you don't need it. And I think that's where you lose people. One of the reasons that even the Democrats are concerned about uh, 
breaking the link between contributions and benefits is, is exactly this, that they're worried about losing the political base for Social Security. Of course, fairness is in the eye of the beholder, as even people who'd probably be subject to the increased taxes were at pains to point out. If one is a teacher, a fireman, or a police officer, all your income is going to be under the Social Security tax. But if you're a managing director at Goldman Sachs and so on, only a very, I mean, small percentage of your income is going to be under that tax. So, I mean, his notion of fairness, in other words, is it's not fair that you make a million dollars a year and you only pay Social Security taxes on 90000 of them. Whereas if you make 50000 a year, you're much closer to the bone, and you're paying taxes on everything you make. Moreover, high earners get a lot of their income not so from pay, but from investments, pay. on which there's no payroll tax at all. You don't have any Social Security on uh, stocks, bonds, capital gains, etc. And a lot of the higher income individuals got a substantial tax break under this administration. So we have already uh, given benefit to the people who are in the higher brackets. But wait a minute. What if we raise the cap on payroll taxes and, at the same time, hike Social Security benefits for high earners? I'm fine with, with the benefit adjustment for people who are rich. And you think that's fair? Yes. And yes, you sir. think that's not fair? You got benefits on the full one point, you know, however million, and if those benefits were, you know, level with what other people get in their benefits, then it might be more acceptable. But even if most of these folks, and most Americans, don't seem to buy the arguments against raising the cap, they may have to acknowledge one made by economist Zeldas, that taxing the rich could have unintended economic consequences, such as... That people supply less labor. They work less because more of their labor income is being taxed. So there's, there's a disincentive perhaps not to work as much. And a disincentive for employers to hire workers making more than $90,000 a year since employers pick up half of the payroll tax debt. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you raise the cost to employ someone, then you're going to have fewer people who are going to be employed. Not only At the end of the day, skills. there were, as usual here on the news hour, as in life, arguments on both sides of the debate over raising the cap on payroll taxes. Stop spreading the news. But there's one final point to make, and it concerns the trend toward income inequality. That is, high earners have been reaping almost all the economic gains of recent years. Yet those gains haven't been shared with Social Security. As folks at the top earn more and more, Zeldas explained with slides, a growing share of total U.S. income is exempted from payroll taxes. Okay, it's now 15%, it used to be 10%. And this trend is exacerbating the looming shortfall in Social Security. I've read people saying the fact that so much of the money is now exempt from Social Security taxes is part of the reason Social Security is underfunded. Is that true? Yes. The greater the growth of, of wages of those under the Social Security earnings cap, the less of a problem we have moving forward for Social Security. How to get more wages under the cap? Well, it turns out that raising the cap to $150,000 today would get us back to the historical average, taxing 90% of total U.S. wages instead of only 85%, as we do right now. It's a proposition our very non-random New York sample seemed to favor, but perhaps because it would raise taxes on the highest American income earners and give them an incentive to oppose or evade the Social Security system, it's a proposition that hasn't seemed to find much favor in the world of politics.